Yeah, I can hold for sure. Let us stand together as we read God's word. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 11. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the world. Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Father God, I pray that as we take some time to unpack all that this passage gives us, God, that we would <clears throat> read your word with your eyes and we would apply them the way that you mean for them to be applied. Show us where we need to have the light shined in our own life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. One of the things that I love about Montreal is the restaurants. And I heard a stat, I haven't been able to uh, validate it, uh, but that never keeps a pastor from using a stat. Uh, but I, the stat that I heard is that Montreal has more restaurants per capita than any other city in the world, and I would tend to believe that. And there's one restaurant in particular that my wife and I love. Uh, and it's called Au Noir. Has anybody ever heard of the restaurant Au Noir? It is a fascinating dining experience. When you go to Au Noir, you, you walk into the lobby, and that's where you place your order. You don't go sit down at the table. You place your order in the lobby. <clears throat> then when your order has been placed, they call your server. And your server comes out from the dining room, and takes you by the arm and puts your arms on their shoulders. And however many people are in your party, you kind of form a conga line and you walk into the dining room. See, uh, your server is blind. And the dining room is, has been designed so that there is zero point of light in all the dining room. Uh, and the whole shtick is that you, you, you eat as if a blind person would eat. You can't see your food. You can't see your glass. How do you know your bread has been buttered all the way around? That's, that's the experience of Au Noir. And my wife and I have been there a couple times. We absolutely love it. it the food is amazing. And uh, my in-laws had uh, come up a couple years ago. And my mother-in-law is a very uh, adventurous lady. And, and so we were telling her about this place. And she said, oh, we got to go. And I said, now listen, zero point of light. So you can't have any watches. You can't have anything that lights up. And she had a little Apple watch. And my mother-in-law does not like to follow the rules very well. And I said, I, you're going to need to take your watch off and, and, and put it in your pocket. She said, no, it'll be fine. I said, I'm, I'm telling you, it's going to go off and it's going to ruin the experience. And she said, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Okay, fine, fine. Because who am I to tell my mother-in-law what to do, right? <laughs> so we go in, we sit down. <clears throat> We're having a, a great time. My father-in-law is freaking out. They're, they've never done anything like this before. And <clears throat> it, it really is, if, if, if ever you've been in a cave and they've turned off the lights and it doesn't matter if your eyes are open and closed, it's, it's, it's almost like a darkness that can be felt. There is zero point of light. So we're eating and, of course, my mother-in-law's uh, uh, Apple Watch goes off with an alert. Now, she had, she had muted it, but underneath the watch, there's a little tiny green light. Tiny. I mean, there, you wouldn't be able to see the light if it was here right now. But that green light, for one brief moment, lit up our table. And for one brief moment, we were able to see our surroundings. The Bible talks a lot about light and darkness in Scripture. And what Paul is saying here in, in chapter 5, verse 8, is that we as believers are light. It says there in verse 8, right? At one time you were darkness, not caught in darkness, not associated with darkness. We were darkness, but now we are 
light. See, it's more than just reflecting God's light. It's more than just shining God's light. As believers, we have been given a new nature. Paul says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, just a couple pages uh, uh, over, and you were dead in trespasses and sin. We weren't sick. We didn't have a behavioral problem. We were dead. We were born as dead people, right? But God, who is rich in love, in, in verse 4, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with him. See, there was a point in time when you were dead and you were in darkness and God shined his light and brought us out of the kingdom of darkness and in to the kingdom of light. And it's not just that we've been enlightened. It's not just that we have received a, a better teaching. We are light. Now, the Bible talks a lot about darkness as a symbol of evil, as a symbol of lostness. And the contrast between darkness and light is so very clearly seen all throughout Scripture. If you have your Bibles, uh, open to uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. And let's just do a little bit of a dive here. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9. Let's start in verse 1. But there will be gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, <clears throat> the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those on whom in a land, uh, those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shown. And this is the same verse that Jesus quoted some hundreds of years later when he began his earthly ministry. What is the light that the people have seen? The light is Jesus. Now the problem with the light, we know, is people who walk in darkness hate the light. Look at John chapter 3 verse 19. beautiful story of, uh, of Jesus speaking with uh, Nicodemus and sharing. And, and we know John 3, 16, right? God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but so that the world through him might be saved. What does verse 19 say? And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their works are evil. What does light do? Light reveals. For that brief moment in time when my mother-in-law's light went off, I was able to see the mess that we had made at our table. Just disgusting. For a brief moment, because of the light, we were able to see the mess that we had made trying to eat as blind people. That's what light does. Light reveals. Light in the Bible is also a symbol of God and his holiness. The light that we shine, the light that we are, is the same light that shines from God in his holiness. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 3. <clears throat> now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, talking about Saul here, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him in a voice, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 1 John chapter 1, verse 5.
John says this, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And this is the same light that we not have, but are. This is the light that God has ordained us not to shine, but to be. We are light. And unlike a flashlight that we can turn on and turn off, we are representatives of the kingdom from which or into which we have been born. Going back to the passage here in Ephesians chapter 5. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So what? What does the last half of that verse say? Walk as children of light. What Paul is saying here is that our behavior needs to match the origin from which our light shines. That the way that we live must correspond with the light that we have become and the light that we have been given. Look at verse 9. He says this, just in, case, just in case we're not sure what that means. When Paul says to walk as children of light, this is what he says here. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. This is my wife's favorite book of the Bible, and this is her favorite verse in the Bible. Uh, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What are the things that we are dwelling on in our mind? What are the things that we are meditating on? What are the things that we are thinking about? And the fruit of light, we all know, Galatians chapter 5. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Sorry, Galatians chapter 6. No, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter (laughs) 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, what does that mean, the fruit of the Spirit? The outworking of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit's working in our lives is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Against such thing there is no against such things there is no need for the law because we by our very nature are fulfilling the law. See what Paul is saying is that our walk the way that we live our lives must correspond with this new nature that we've been given. 1 John chapter 6 Go back to 1 John for a second. I'm still learning to transition back and forth between my glasses. I recently went blind myself. It's called old age. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. This is how I lived when I was in high school. I was a Christian. I got saved when I was, when I was about four or five years old. I, I, I understood the plan of salvation. I responded to the plan of salvation. And then when I was in high school, I, I was the worst kind of Christian that you could ever be. I was a hypocrite. I went to church. I went to youth group. I was a pastor's kid. I, I knew all the right verses. I knew all the Bible stories. I, 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 I knew all the songs. I was your model Christian kid at school, and then I would go, or I was the model kid at church, and then I would go to school, and I would live just like the world did. I was living a lie. What Paul, or what John says here in in verse 6, that if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in what? Walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the what? 
in the light. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. See, this is another interesting uh, reality about walking in light, is it affects our relationship with one another. As we walk in light, our fellowship with one another becomes sweeter, becomes more intimate, becomes more real. See, God called us out of darkness into his kingdom, into his family, and into a community. You guys have a beautiful community here at this church. And how you walk, how you shine your light affects not only yourself, but it affects everybody around you. And then Paul says this in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 5. He says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, that word try is an unfortunate translation of a Greek word. It doesn't mean do your best. It doesn't mean give it the old college try. It doesn't mean do as much as you can. Literally what that verse means is to, what what that word, it means to test, to prove for yourself, to learn by doing to take careful thought and discrimination. It means to have a completely thought out plan. Many years ago during the the first Gulf War back in the 90s, I was was listening to a a soldier uh, who who was being interviewed. He had, uh, they they were somewhere in in Iraq and uh, he he was leading a uh, team of soldiers and they were going into a a, a house that they thought was a a, a friendly house and and, and they were confronted with a a, a, a whole mass of of enemy soldiers. Uh, And his team came under heavy fire. Well, this young soldier single-handedly saved the lives of all the men in his unit. And later on, he was interviewed. He was asked how it was that he was able to do the things that he did without, without any thought, without you know, considering what it was that he was going to do. Well, he said, I didn't wait until I had been confronted with the enemy to develop a plan. I knew the battle area that we were walking into. And I knew that going house to house meant that there was a possibility that one of these homes could be filled with enemies. And so I started developing a plan in my mind what would happen if we opened the door and we were met with enemy fire. And I poured over this plan in my mind for weeks and weeks and weeks before we went out to our deployment. So that when the time came, I didn't have to consider what I was going to do. I knew exactly what I was going to do. You know, when Daniel and his friends had been taken captive into Babylon, um, there's this little verse at Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 that, that Daniel had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's delicacies. See, the route from Jerusalem to Babylon would have taken a couple of months at least. And that term had purposed in his heart. That doesn't mean that Daniel waited until he got to the walls of Babylon to decide what he was going to do. As they traveled, Daniel made a plan as a young man. As a young man, he could have been as young as 11 years old. We got a young man 11 years old here right now. Daniel could have been about that age. Somewhere between 11 and 14, 15. This is how old Daniel was. And Daniel and his friends had purposed in their hearts what they were going to do when they came to the godless city of Babylon. And this is the idea that Paul gives when he says to try to discern, going back to verse 9, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Literally what that means, that as believers in the safety of our home, in the safety of this gathering, we are determining now 
We are planning now for how we are going to live our lives. We are planning now what we are going to do when we are faced with temptation. Why, do we, why is that important? Why do we do that now? Why do we do that in the comfort of our home? Because that's a safe place. This is the place for us to devise our battle strategy. This is the place where we discern those things in our life that are getting in the way of us shining our light. He says, discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Make certain in your mind the things that please the Lord and the things that don't. And it's very, very simple. We act like the will of God is this super secret thing that only the very wise pastors, myself and Paul, we know the will of God because, because we're old men who have studied the word of God for years and years and years. And so we're going to help you discern that. No, 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 no. The word of God is so simple. The will of God is so simple. Micah says in Micah 6, 8, he has shown thee, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of thee to do justly. To do the right thing, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And then Paul says in verse 11, and this is the crux here, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Paul writes this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with darkness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what accord has Christ with Belial? And we oftentimes use use this verse as a, as a verse uh, to, to warn young people about, about dating uh, unsaved people and about, and about not marrying an unsaved person. And, and, and that's true. That's true. But that's not the context of this passage. The context of this passage is our day-to-day -day living. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that we don't have unbelieving friends. To be yoked together, that was a farming term where you took two oxen and you laid one piece of wood on both of their necks and you fashioned, you, 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 you fastened that to their necks so that these two oxen were moving in the same direction. They had the same purpose because two oxen is a lot stronger than one oxen. Don't be unequally yoked with somebody that's going to be going the other direction as you. Don't be unequally yoked. Don't have intimacy with people that have a different worldview from us. Why? Because as, as Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts what? Good morals. As a youth pastor, I... I uh, there's a very fun way to, 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 to illustrate this passage. Um, I'm, a, I'm a hefty boy, and I would get up on a chair, and I would stand up on a chair, and I would ask a, a, a smaller member of our youth group to, 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 to come, uh, to come and stand uh, beside me, right, uh, on the floor while I stood on the chair. And what I would do is I would, I would try to pull them up to the chair where I was. And that was very difficult. It was a very difficult thing to do despite, despite my size. And then I would ask them to try to jerk me off the chair. And they were very excited to do that to their youth pastor. And they did it with ease. See, what that verse says is that what ends up happening to a believer that has regular fellowship with the world, we become like the world. That was my life when I was in high school. 
I, 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 I dedicated my life to the Lord when I was 13. We moved up here uh, onto the mission field when I was 12, and I hated it, hated it here. No offense. We had moved from Phoenix, Arizona. I hated the cold. I hated the snow. Je détestais le français. J'aime beaucoup le français maintenant. It's such a beautiful language. I hated everything about being here. Then God got a hold of my heart. And I dedicated my life to the Lord when I was 13. And I developed this strategy that I was going to win my friends by becoming like them. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. What ended up happening? You all know what happened. Instead of my friends becoming more like me, I became more like my friends. Bad company corrupts good morals. I was given good morals. What does Jesus say about leaven? A little bit of leaven leavens an entire lump. It doesn't take much. I used to use this illustration with my youth group too. Uh, would bake a giant pan of brownies, right? And I said, just before I served the brownies, and I want you guys to know, I mean, it was big. Big tray of brownies. Now, just before you eat the brownies, I want you to know that I have taken one half of a teaspoon of my dog's poop, and I've added it into the brownie. You can't taste it. You'd never know it if I didn't tell you. But there's a little bit of poop in these brownies. Not much. I mean, when you think about the sheer volume of, of, of mix right? Over a gallon of mix and one tiny half of a tea. Now, obviously, I didn't do that. So I'm not going to ruin a whole, you know, the whole tray of brownies, right? But the point was, a little bit of bad company spoils good character. And this is what Paul says as he closes up this section. He says, don't take any part, uh, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't take any part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead, instead expose them. Now, so oftentimes we use that as marching orders to expose the darkness to everybody around us. Well, you got this thing wrong with you, and there's something wrong with you, and there's something the matter with you. And, and yet so oftentimes we forget to start that work in us. How does David close out Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24? Let's turn there really quickly and meditate on this. Psalm 139. <clears throat> David writes this. Search everybody else, O God. Is that what it says? What's he say? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous or wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Essentially what, what David is praying here is God reveal myself to myself. Help me to see me the way you see me. Not the way the other people see me. Help me to see myself the way that you see me. Why do we need to pray that prayer? Because as Jeremiah writes, the heart is wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? And then he says, I, the Lord, test the heart. See, we are so good at deceiving ourselves. We err on one of two extremes. The one extreme is, man, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like that tax collector. I thank you, Lord, that, that I am not like that sinner. Or the other extreme that we err on is, oh, God, woe is me. I am unfit to serve. I am horrible. You, you know the wicked things that I've done. Those are two very unhealthy and unbiblical extremes. 
When we invite God to reveal ourselves to ourselves, be very careful because he will do just that. And that is how we are able to discern, to try to prove what is the will of God. Why is that important? Or as I like to say in youth groups, so what? Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy people, a people of God's own heart. Why? So that you may sing the praises of him that called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You are light. I am light. Walk as children of light. How is Bornwall, Shattagy, Verdun, LaSalle, Montreal? How are they going to know if our lights are dimmed? Father God, <clears throat> We were once darkness. We loved the darkness, the unfruitful works of sin. And at one point in time, you called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. And you have given us a challenge this morning to walk as children of light, to walk in a manner that brings honor and glory to you. And Father, I pray for myself that you would reveal myself to myself. I pray for each and every one in this congregation and people who are watching online, God, that you would help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. God, if there is anybody listening to this sermon that has, that has never answered the call to come out of darkness and into your marvelous light, God, that we would do that now. That we would respond to this beautiful message of salvation. That we would realize that you alone have given us forgiveness of sins. And it is by your shed blood that we can stand uncondemned before you. And for the rest of us, Father, I pray that you would do a work in our lives. That you would reveal to us the areas in our life where our light has been dimmed. Where the shadows have, have, have taken over. And I pray that we would walk as children of light. And our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and all God's people said amen